Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. It is great to be here, and I'm super excited for today's topic because it really is bridging the gap as to what longevity and anti-aging will look like as we're moving into the next three to five years or so and how there's a possibility we'll be able to actually rewind aging and reverse many diseases of the body. So one of the reasons why I am excited about this particular episode and I'm going to link up all the research here today make it I'm going to make it real world so that you can actually use this and it'll be at stephencabral.com forward slash 2174 stephencabral.com forward slash 2174 all previous podcasts can be found at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast okay so here's the thing we'll talk about a high fat diet we'll talk about some particular pros some particular cons and just issues in general around it. But I also want to share with you how there is a longevity-based nutrient that has been known about now for decades and is finally getting a lot more press. One of the reasons why it's getting more press is that it's actually easier now to get more of it in a condensed form so that we can actually begin to reverse the aging-based process. So that nutrient is called resveratrol. Hold on for a moment. Hold that word. And uh, we're going to get into it right now because... We know that for most people, a high-fat diet is extremely detrimental to their health. Now, there's a lot of people out there promoting keto, a lot of people out there promoting low-carb. Okay, so if you're you're not even promoting keto, but you're promoting low-carb, then you have no choice but to either increase protein, we know there can be detrimental effects of that, once you go above 20% uh, of your macronutrient profile... It increases mTOR, it increases IGF-1. We know that can lead to greater chances of cancer. Not saying it's going to, but there's potential for it. Okay, do I ever increase protein above 20, 25% with some people? Sure, I do. It depends on age. It depends on whether they're exercising a lot, how much muscle tissue breakdown it is. But you have to understand is some people take words that I say or other people say out of context, right? Everything's nuanced. But we're talking about the average person, the average American. Less than I think it's 8% of the population actually exercises, okay? So we're not talking about like, and th- and that's generous, by the way. That's gen- That's a generous number, okay? When 70% of people are overweight and over now 35% of children are overweight and about 40% of adults are obese and now it's somewhere around 18 to 25% nobody knows exactly if children are obese we have to understand is that the average person in population those are the people that need our help so if you're a practitioner listening to this they need our help we have to start talking to the majority of people when i talk about bmi people lose their minds because they're in the 1% of the population that exercises, they have more muscle on their body, they're in shape, and they just can't handle being a 25.5 or a 26. Listen, I'm at the top end of the BMI. I totally understand. I get it. I'm not coming down to you. Remember, as practitioners in the health and fitness field, we need to work with the 99% of the population that should be at a good healthy weight for their body. But again, I'm not going to turn that into the show. So let me take a step back. The majority of people don't really know what healthy fats are versus just being on a high fat diet, right? They just know, oh, well, if I go low carb and I just eat vegetables or don't eat any starches and don't eat any fruit, I'm I'm automatically on a low carb diet. We have to understand that is very dangerous, right? Because we're not telling people to have, hey, eat some more avocados, have some olives, have some olive oil that's organic, cold pressed right? That hasn't been heated and it's in a dark bottle. We're not saying all of those things. So what do they read? Like, oh, I can just eat all the fat and meat that I want. That is very detrimental. I did a podcast actually that was all science backed showing that carbohydrates do not cause diabetes. Okay. They, they just don't, right? Carbs don't cause diabetes. We haven't seen this anywhere in nature. We don't see it in humans. I shared with you the data on people on high-carb diets not having diabetes. Now, you combine highly oxidized fats and oils with carbohydrates. That's a recipe for disaster. But I'm going to take you into the research. It is because, and I've been saying this forever, and finally a lot of experts out there, and I'm putting that in air quotes, are are catching on that you have to be careful because a super high fat diet in 26% of the population is going to cause massive inflammation. Okay. I've talked about that before. APOE genotypes, the allele is a 4-4. Okay. But you say that's only 26% of the population. I say, I agree. But in other people, when you have a high fat diet, you are for lack, I'm just going to give this at a, a, a base level. You are essentially clogging up 
the insulin receptors in the outside of cells. You are creating more sterols in that cell membrane. And that does not allow for oxygen or glucose to very easily penetrate that bilipid membrane. So bilipid membrane, think of it as out the outside of every cell. If you're watching this on video, I'm just holding my hands up in a circle, okay? And the membrane are basically my fingers going around. Inside of this membrane to allow things into the, each cell is soft fats and hard fats. The more saturated, the more, well, I shouldn't say poly, polyunsaturated are actually the the weakest, the lightest. However, here's what happens. Those polyunsaturated fats, fats can be very easily oxidized. Now, that's, when, that's not when they're eaten with nuts and things like that. We've actually seen positive benefits there. So why do polyunsaturated fats get a bad rap? Because when they are oxidized, when they are cooked with, when they are put into processed foods, they're, they cause massive massive free radical damage. They're called reactive oxygen species, ROS. Okay, you don't need to know what that means, but it creates aging in your body. Reactive oxygen species create inflammation. Inflammation creates inflammaging. Your body ages at a faster rate. So I want to share with you the research right now that I think will make a whole lot of sense and may make you question your high fat diet. Now, Again, people then always say, well, I eat grass-fed beef and I eat pastured chicken and pastured eggs and I eat wild salmon and sardines and I, you know, have my own farm in my backyard. I get it. I get it. Again, we're talking about the 1%. Do you think that the average person walking around is buying all grass-fed beef and organ meat and they're eating uh, kangaroo and elk and all these things? They're not. I mean, this is this is outlandish speak that we talk about to really refer to like the 1% of the people that are, you know, trying to do everything right, right? That That's just not the case. And even some of those people though, you know, they're really overdoing it by throwing in a big thing of lard with bacon grease with eggs. You have to be careful with that. 20s and 30s years old. Okay. I understand. You start doing that for a decade of your life. Uh, I would, uh, I would be careful playing that game of roulette. You know, the, the body always works on balance. And so just be, just be careful. We're not talking about body transformation. We're not talking about the outside. We're talking about the inside, right? You can easily transform your body with a high fat, high protein diet and get very lean and muscular, no doubt about it. But we're not talking about that today. We're talking about aging and longevity. And if you want to bet your life, what you're literally doing on that super high fat diet, I would be careful with that. I would continue to run all of your biomarkers, and that does not just include blood work. But again, I digress. So, I'm going to share with you the research, and then I'm going to link up multiple studies, okay? Because I had to go deep on this research because the research is very dense, very dense. So I had to look up what type of diets these uh, rats and mice were on and all of that. So uh, here we go. But again, keep in mind when we say, oh, it's, a, it's just a mouse study. It's just a rat study. Keep in mind they put human DNA into these mice. That's how they're bred. And so instead of having an experiment on humans, we can, we can do it in this way and we can at least gather some good data because you wouldn't want to put humans through uh, much of what the lab research has done with lab rats. Again, whether you agree with it or testing lab rats or not, that's not today's discussion. Uh, anyway, I digress. Okay. So we're looking at, uh, the diet that these mice were put on for eight weeks. Okay. And even in just eight weeks, the insulin secretion ability of the rats was greatly decreased. So that means this, that these mice were not able to produce the same amount of insulin. They were not as sensitive to the insulin. And it was because of the high fat diet they were on. Now I'll share with you the fat in just a moment. Cause again, I can already hear in the background, what type of fat was it? And I agree again, we're, we're getting there with just one second. All right. So there was two groups. Uh, there was the normal chow feed, they call it for rats. And that was, let me get you that data for what that was exactly exactly for the normal feed. Well, I have the high fat feed right in front of me. So it was 59% fat, 20% carbs uh, for the high fat feed. And uh, that's 60, 80. So then we're assuming 21% protein, right? Because that's, that's how the math works out. So just think of it as 60, 20, 20. Okay. 60% uh, fat, 20% carbs, 20% protein, probably not wildly different from a lot of people's low carb diet. And again, putting that in ear quotes. And then the normal uh, chow feed I will be able to find it for you. Let's see if I can uh, just gather it right now. If not, I'll link up the article. But it's basically like 60% uh, carbs 
and uh, and then 2020. Oh, there it is right there. All right. So the normal child feed was 13.68% fat, 64% carbs, and about 21% protein. So the protein remained uh, roughly the same. They took the fat and they basically added all to the carbohydrates, and that's how they got that number. So high fat diet, 59%, 20% carbs, 20% protein. And uh, what they found was that it created insulin resistance, which is, again, detrimental for what? Well, it's extremely detrimental for trying to prevent cancer, okay? Extremely detrimental for cholesterol reasons, blood pressure reasons, triglyceride reasons, stroke, type 2 diabetes, okay? So when we're looking at that, we're saying, wow, those are all the top causes of mortality. And a high-fat diet, this high-fat diet was leading to that. So again, that's why I just ask you, be careful what diet plans you are following if they are not set up properly. Now, for all of the people in the back, I totally get it. What type of fat was it? So I had to go deep on this because it didn't state it on PubMed. So I went into the original research and I found that the high-fat diet was coming from mainly polyunsaturated fats. And I agree, polyunsaturated fats, when oxidized, are the most dangerous types of fats out there. Non-oxidized can actually be beneficial for the body. That's why I come at it from a an unbiased perspective. Now, do I think you should load up on polyunsaturated fats? No. Do I think polyunsaturated fats from fish and nuts in their whole form are bad? No. Do I think if you take a uh, triglyceride-bound, cold, processed, and pressed fish oil or oil that has not been heated is bad? No, because I can show you all of the data that shows that that's okay. Now, the moment you turn that into, I can't believe it's not butter or processed crackers or chips or anything like that, well, it's highly oxidized and that is extremely detrimental to the body. So here's the good news though, because that's, that's a normal, this is a normal low carb diet for most people. Again, let's not pretend that people are eating, again, pastured chicken and wild fish every night with theirs. Now, some people are, but again, part of that 1%. For the average person, they're just saying, well, I can eat all the fat I want, and basically that means meat for them, and I feel great. Well, again, you feel great for a while, and externally, the body begins to lose weight. So you say, hey, it's all working. Be careful, all right? But I want to show you that even if that is what people are doing, there, it's and it's amazing. It's amazing how much the human body can really withstand. But we're now showing, and it's amazing that they even use this nutrient. I don't know how they got it paid for. I have no idea how they got a nutritional supplement paid for for this. But they used resveratrol. Resveratrol. People say, oh, it's found in uh, red wine. Sure, it is. Um, this is largely corroborated that it would take a hundred to two hundred glasses of wine for an actual dosage of resveratrol that's going to make a difference, okay? So we can kind of pull back on the red wine. I drink red wine. You know, people saying, I drink red wine because that is resveratrol. No, you drink red, wi red wine because you enjoy red wine. That's, that's why you're drinking it. We're not doing this for overall health reasons, okay? Maybe it helps you relax. Maybe that leads to some vasodilation. But again, I'm not, I'm not talking about that here today, okay? But what I can share with you is that somehow someone got this study published or, and actually paid for, because you have to do this, to see if resveratrol may help with insulin levels. And I thought this was remarkable. And they even state in the study, and I'm going to see if I can find the exact line for you, because I was blown away when they actually uh, gave, here it is, resveratrol, RSV, which is stated in the study for short, is a natural compound found in grape skins. Results of many studies have provided evidence for its beneficial effects, including anti-cancer, antioxidant, cardioprotective, that means good for the heart, and overall lifespan and anti-aging, so lifespan. Okay, so there is also growing evidence that resveratrol improves insulin sensitivity in type 2 diabetic animals or patients. Uh, in this study, uh, Brasneo, I apologize if that's not how you pronounce that person's name, reported that patients who were treated with oral resveratrol twice daily containing five milligrams of resveratrol for four weeks have significantly improved insulin resistance with increased P, AKT, uh, which is a, a ratio inside of the platelets. Uh, so pretty amazing. Again, I'm amazing that they even got this published. The second, in this particular study, this is high dose, okay? So they showed benefits in just 
I mean, it's five milligrams, five milligrams twice a day. It's 10 milligrams. It's unbelievable because that's not a big dose. It's a small dose. In this study, they were using straight resveratrol. I want to show you how you can, uh, I hate the word hack, but how you can hack this a bit. So they used 100 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Uh, for this particular study, they actually did double that as well, and they both they, they both showed um, uh, clinically verifiable positive data on that. So that's a big dose. Now, when you're looking though at, at resveratrol, you can find products that say resveratrol, or you can find it where it says trans resveratrol. Trans resveratrol is the best form we have right now in order to be able to use a lower dosage with better uh, absorbability. The issue that resveratrol was kind of forgotten about about a decade, I remember like 15 years ago being popular, but they just couldn't get it to work because they couldn't get it in an absorbable form. Well, like many things such as, right, curcumin, think about it, turmeric. Turmeric, we knew that it would work in a Petri dish or Vintra. We know that it would work. The problem was you just couldn't get it to absorb in the human body. Then came bioparine, right? Bioparine, black pepper. And again, they knew this in Ayurveda. They always mixed it with black pepper. That helped to absorb. Okay, so that's interesting. But then they were able to extract curcumin. Oh, okay. So now we have curcuminoids from turmeric, and now we need much less. So we get a much better clinical result. Well, the same thing happened res with resveratrol. They were able to get a more absorbable form called transresveratrol. I'm willing to bet you in five years from now, there's an even more absorbable form. But for right now, we have transfer rest veritrol, and that's pretty fantastic. So what I wanted to bring you is this, is that there were two parts to this podcast. One, I just want you to be careful on a high fat diet for a long period of time. If you do it for three weeks to maybe six weeks as you're um, lowering your carbs for a bit of time and you are helping with weight loss and regulating blood sugar, okay, I, I understand it, but then we can ease them back in. Because as we've seen, a lot of these people on high fat diets can never eat carbs again. And they're like, well, I just can't eat carbs because it spikes my blood sugar. Yeah, it does that because you are destroying your insulin sensitivity. And again, I can't say that any other way and I don't want to mix any words with you. You're not helping the problem. You're just putting a Band-Aid on it because you're saying, oh, I can't eat carbs, so I'm not going to eat carbs. And then you're making the situation even worse. Figure out why you have such uh, poor insulin sensitivity. Fix that. Rebalance the body. Be able to eat carbohydrates again. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. Fix the gut. Fix the cortisol levels. Rebalance the thyroid. You'll be able to get there. I mean, that, that's what I want to share with people, that these things can be fixed. Be careful with a Band-Aid-based approach. Now, if you're eating a high-fat diet for an extended period of time, do go for the pastured-based uh, uh, beef, I'm uh, sorry, pasture-based chicken and eggs, the grass-fed beef, because uh, they're going to be higher in omega-3s, less than the omega-6s, less than the polys. Um, okay, uh, the wild fish, I talked about that, but really, we're talking about high fat. That's more protein. There's certainly fat in that, but they're going to be less because they are more natural. So you really want to stick to more avocados, uh, olives, olive oil that isn't heated, or uh, again, I, I don't want to get into the olive oil uh, right now, and uh, and then some nuts, and you're going to be able to get good quality fats there. All right, so I just wanted to share that part with you, and now, at the same time, let's say you are having blood sugar levels. I have to now state uh, that I'm not providing any medical advice, right? No medical diagnosis, cures, or treatment of disease, but what I want to share with you is that if you're dealing with potentially uh, family history of cancer, cardiovascular issues, uh, blood sugar issues, etc. You may want to look into a good trans resveratrol based product. Uh, it might be something that you it would interest you because there is just such great research around it. So just wanted to share that with you here today. Would love to take any comments you have, any feedback. And like I said, I'm always happy to help. And I just want you to know that I will give you, uh, till the day I die, an unbiased version of nutrition, exercise, uh, disease and all the different states in the body so that we can all be on this journey together. We can all learn this journey together. And as better and better research comes out, well, we'll say, what did Ayurvedic medicine say? And, and all the different forms of, of natural-based health, what are they saying in the science, the scientific research? Okay, how do these look together? And what is the best choice for us? So hopefully that was helpful. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today. Please do feel free to share this show with anyone you believe it could help. <laughs>